Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to episode, I believe it's 153 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name's Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur. A lot of ranting this week. Things that uh, I think that uh, you should know about and should be concerned about. Uh, if you have any reactions to the show, you can email them to me directly. Whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com is the email address. Uh, or you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. You can get the email address from there, or you can leave a comment there. If, uh, if you do email me, please include something in the subject line so that it's clearly not spam. And uh, be a little patient. I'm, I'm kind of slow about email, uh, but I, um, I do answer. You will get an answer. All right, with all that traditional stuff out of the way, let's get to it. Every week, when I can, if I can, I like to start with some good news. Uh, and this week, I got two quick bits of good news to, to start with. One is that Virginia is one of those states where a uh, federal district court judge has ruled that the state's ban on same-sex marriage is unconstitutional. And like in the other cases uh, where this has come up, that decision is on hold uh, while the, in this case, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals considers the case. Uh, oral arguments before that court on this case are scheduled for May. Well. So here's hoping, and here's the good news, here's hoping that those judges are made aware of a new poll out of Quinnipiac University, which finds that a right to marriage equality is now supported by 50% of Virginia voters, with only 42% opposed. Women support marriage justice by a margin of 54 to 38. Men are basically split, say 46 in favor and 48 against, and that gap is within the margin of error for the polls. That's basically an even split. What's particularly notable, however, is that those aged 18 to 29 endorse the right of same-sex marriage by a margin of 69 to 25. Justice is coming. Uh, the other bit of good news comes out of another court, this one being the World Court at The Hague. In 1986, Japan, the nation of Japan, signed off on an international moratorium on whaling. However, every year since then, Japan has continued to do whaling, continued to hunt hundreds of minke whales in the southern ocean. This is uh, the ocean that surrounds Antarctica. Uh, hundreds of minke whales, plus uh, a certain number of fin and humpback whales. The justification for this, uh, Japan cited a 1946 treaty which allows for whaling for scientific purposes. Well, the thing is, however, that Japan would catch and kill these whales for scientific studies that usually consisted of little more than counting the number of fish in the whale's stomachs. And then, of course, while well, you've got all this whale meat, you don't want to just dump it back in the water. You want to do something with it. So, hey, what the heck, we'll sell it on the commercial market in Japan. Uh, it was clear to environmentalists and to scientists that uh, for decades, Japan had been using this excuse about scientific research as an excuse to uh, evade the restrictions on commercial whaling. Well, now, happily, the World Court has agreed. By a vote of 12 to 4, the court has ordered Japan to stop the whaling, saying that its program is not scientific. The decision is a major victory for Australia, which brought the suit, and for environmentalists to oppose whaling on ethical grounds. Uh, however, it will not mean the end of whaling. Uh, for one thing, Japan has another whaling program, which was not part of this suit, so it's not affected by it. And there are two nations, Norway and Iceland, which openly engage in commercial whaling, so they weren't covered by it either. Second thing is that the ruling actually technically only suspends this Japanese program uh, until Japan can come up with a better designed program of research involving killing fewer whales, assuming, of course, that it actually can. The thing is, despite these limitations, this is a victory for the whales, uh, and especially because, meanwhile, demand for whale meat is declining. Uh, even among those nations that have been engaging in the whaling in order to sell it as commercial meat. For example, Norwegian whalers now rarely even catch up to the limit 
set by the Norwegian government because the demand for the meat just isn't big enough. So this ruling is another step, just a small step, but it is a step that says that maybe we actually can stop whaling. All right, now we're moving on to one of our regular weekly features. It's the outrage of the week. Uh, the outrage of this week starts with a quote from Barack Obama. In rejecting any comparison between Russia's seizure of Crimea and the U.S.'s invasion of Iraq, the, our president, the amazing Mr. O, said this, and this is a quote, Even in Iraq, America sought to work within the international system. We did not claim or annex Iraq's territory, nor did we grab its resources for our own gain. Instead, we ended our war and left Iraq to its people, and a fully sovereign Iraqi state could make decisions about its future. Has he utterly taken leave of his senses? Or is he just c counting on Americans' notoriously short memories and our cultural eagerness to pat ourselves in the back with how noble and self-sacrificing we are? Frankly, I can't come up with another explanation of why and how he could make a statement like that that is so out of touch with reality. Work within the international system? We illegally invaded another country which had done us no harm and was no threat to us. We justified it not through truth or fact, but through propaganda about ties to Al-Qaeda, which had never been, uh, dark deceitful hints about an Iraqi connection to 9-11, which never were, and outright lies about weapons of mass destruction, which did not exist. And we knew it all along. We, that is our government, and I use the word our here advisedly, our government knew this was propaganda, deceit, and lies. They knew it all along. We outright refused to seek a Security Council resolution that would actually authorize the use of force in Iraq because we knew we'd lose. Even though the government of our close ally and presidential lapdog, UK Prime Minister Tony Blair, told the Shrub Gang that the war would be illegal without that resolution. We cheated, we deceived, we lied through our governmental teeth and first ignored and then violated international law to justify a war which is never about terrorism or 9-11 or WMDs, but about petty revenge backed by corporate greed driven by power hunger. Work within the international system? Is he insane? What we did do was release what we called shock and awe. We attacked, we invaded, we bombed, we destroyed, we killed. Thousands, tens of thousands, scores of thousands killed. The Iraq body count, and this is a group which uh, counts up civilian deaths in Iraq. They use a very, very conservative method to confirm civilian, non-combatant deaths, people killed in direct military action. Non-combatants killed in direct military action, and they can confirm about 136,000 Iraqis, non-combatant civilians, killed by direct war violence. Other surveys that use standard methodologies for doing surveys in war zones, and that look for all deaths, combatants and non-combatants alike, and deaths from all causes, including the indirect causes like lack of potable water or lack of medical supplies because of the war, they came up with death tolls in the millions. What's more, we unleashed simmering ethnic hatreds and divisions that drove the country into a civil war from which it is yet to fully recover. So yeah, a Russia, a Russia has illegally annexed part of another country. Yes, it has. But it's true, there really isn't a comparison to what we did in Iraq. And speaking of our war in Iraq, um, a very revealing thing the amazing Mr. O said in that quote was, we ended our war. Not the war, our war. Which first acknowledges that it was, in fact, our war. But more than that, there were two things here. First, we didn't end our war. The Iraqis did. 
George Bush was forced by the Iraqi government to accept a deadline for getting U.S. forces out of Iraq, a deadline of December 31st, 2011. The alternative was the Iraqis said, you'll have to leave immediately. So he was forced to accept that deadline. Barack Obama came into office with that deadline already set. His administration tries to pressure the Iraqis to let that deadline slip to allow for tens of thousands of U.S. troops to remain in Iraq after that deadline for training and counterterrorism activities. But they also wanted U.S. troops to be immune from prosecution under Iraqi law. That was a deal breaker. The Iraqis wouldn't go for that, so uh, uh, Obama could not convince him to make a change, and so the U.S. troops had to leave. We didn't end our war. We got kicked out. And there's the other thing. Our war. Not the war. Our war. The war, the war, the civil war in Iraq is not over for the Iraqis. Not even today. The level of violence has ebbed and flowed, but recently it has flowed. 2013 was the bloodiest year in Iraq in at least six years, and 2014 is shaping up to be just as bad, if not worse. In the past couple of days, just in the past couple of days, a series of attacks, including shootings, bombings, and a suicide bombing, has killed 22 people in Iraq. Five in Tikrit, eight in Mosul, five in Ramadi, and four in a suburb of Baghdad. An additional 27 people were injured in these same attacks. Which brings us to leaving Iraq to its people. The government, of Iraq, the government of Iraq is technically a democracy. In form, it's a democracy. But in reality, it is a government dominated by Shiites. And much of the most recent violence can be traced to battles between government forces and Sunni rebels based in the Anbar province in the, in the uh, western part of Iraq. The central government of Prime Minister Nuri al-Malikai and his Shiite coalition now stands accused of oppression and favoritism. During his term, he's been in office since 2006. During Malikai's term, thousands of people have been arrested, imprisoned, and even tortured by the regime. Protesters have been shot at, they have been killed, and resistance is met with shelling that kills civilians as well as insurgents. In fact, since the U.S. left, things have actually gotten worse. Now, there are nightly shellings and mortar attacks by the Iraqi army, which is in addition to the terrorism that never actually stopped. Meanwhile, political opponents have been persecuted in Iraq. In fact, a spark for the most recent upsurge in violence was the arrest of a leading Sunni politician on what appeared to be bogus charges of aiding terrorism. That violence, that most recent violence, has led to charges out of the cities of Ramada and Fallujah that government forces there have detained, tortured, and even raped civilians, while NGO, that's non-governmental organizations, NGO workers there accuse the government of war crimes, including preventing medicines from getting into those cities. So is the government of Iraq in a battle? Yes, it is. Is it a democracy? No, it's not. Because, particularly because even looking beyond the violence, the government of Iraq looks more like a regime of reactionary repression than a democracy. Moves are being undertaken uh, at various levels of government and in various, uh, uh, various areas of the country to undo, for this is one, one example of this, they're moving to undo the progress women in Iraq have made at uh, expanding and protecting their rights. Some government departments are now requiring female employees to be veiled. Local governments in at least two provinces want to force women who are members of the local authorities, that is, who have jobs, to be accompanied by their husbands or fathers or brothers when they go to work and at any other time they leave their house. Most notoriously, a draft law now before the Iraqi parliament would legalize the marriage of girls as young as nine, would legalize marital rape, and restrict women's rights in matters of parenting, uh, divorce, and inheritance. The laws would give men strict guardianship over their wives and give them uh, uh, automatic custody of children in divorce cases if the children are more than two years old. 
This is not, you have to understand, not some far out, never to see the light of day proposal of the sort we often see in various places in the U.S. This was introduced by the Minister of Justice and it was approved by Iraqi's Council of Ministers more than two weeks ago. That is the Iraq we have grandly, according to our Nobel Peace Prize president, grandly left to its people. The country we so nobly freed to be a sovereign state as if it wasn't before. The country we treated apparently so gently and so kindly. A government, a country marked by violence, death, repression, and turning back the clock on women's rights. So no, Iraq is not like Crimea. If we are, in fact, as, as Mr. O has said on more than one occasion, the people for whom we have been waiting, I'd rather wait for Gatto. And as for you, Mr. Obama, uh, you, uh, I will say this for you. You clearly are in the right political party because you're acting like a jackass. And for trying to whitewash a despicable chapter in our nation's history, you are the outrage of the week. We are going to take a break. And we're back. Uh, all right, the last couple of weeks I said I was going to talk about global warming. I kept putting it off because I was waiting for the latest reports to come out, and now they have, so now I'm going to talk about it. Okay. The IPCC has released the second of three reports that are part of this latest round of reports uh, on the climate on global warming. Now, the IPCC, as you probably know, it's the United Nations Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's an international, scientific, and governmental attempt to address and understand global warming and how to respond to it. Uh, each report that the IPCC comes out with is based on hundreds to thousands of peer-reviewed scientific research papers, which are then reviewed by hundreds of lead authors whose work is critiqued and refined before it's released. Now, the first of these uh, latest series of reports was issued last September, and that was about the scientific certainties that were involved in global warming. And that report confirmed what anyone at all familiar with the issue already knew. There is overwhelming agreement among scientists in relevant disciplines that the climate is changing, that the world is warming, and that human activities are the cause. And the fact is we could be no more than 25 years away from a tipping point, a point at which we could no longer head off the worst effects of global warming, effects which could become self-reinforcing. So yes, despite what the nanny nanny naysayers, uh, nanny nanny naysayers will try to tell you, the science is settled. Period. There are arguments about how over just how fast things will change, about just how bad the effects will be, about just how hot uh, it will get, but the basic facts are not in dispute. The basic reality is not. And, and, and because the thing is, the data just does not allow for any other rational interpretation. And it's still happening, still happening now. Uh, for example, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, said that 2013 worldwide was the fourth warmest year on record. These records go back to about 1880. NASA said it was the seventh warmest. Now, the, the differences in ranking there are based on fractions of a degree, and they are based on uh, differences in how the two agencies extrapolate the data from weather stations to cover the areas of the world where there aren't any weather stations to give data. Uh, the point is these are minor differences. The World Meteorological Organization, what they do is they take the data from NASA and from NOAA, they add in the data from the Climate Research Unit in the United Kingdom, combine all these into one, they say 2013 was the sixth warmest year on record. In fact, the warmth of 2013 adds to the string of record warm years that have been seen in this century. Nine of the ten warmest and 13 of the 14 warmest years on record have occurred in the 21st century. 
It also adds to the string of decades that have each been warmer than the last. You know, to consider climate, you really shouldn't consider individual years one at a time. You need over time. You need patterns. So you should look at at, at least decades. You you really should look more like 30-year conks to, to really get a, a really good sense, but at least decades. Or with that in mind, look at this chart. Look at this chart. I find this chart amazing. Notice what this chart shows, that with the exception of the 1940s, which were unusually warm for their period, uh, every decade since the 19-teens has been warmer than the decade that preceded it. Uh, and in fact, the 1980s were clearly far away the warmest decade on record until the 1990s, which were warmer, and until the 2000s, which were even warmer than that. Look, at do you see a trend here? Put this another way. The combined average temperature over global land and ocean surface, basically now the average of the entire surface of the Earth. This is for February 2014, worldwide average. February 2014 was the 348th consecutive month. That's 29 full years where the, average, the temperature for that month was higher than the average for that month for the 20th, uh, 20th century. For 29 years, every January has been warmer than the average for the 20th century for January. Every February has been warmer than the average for February, and so on. For 29 straight years. So how much hotter will things, are things going to get? Well, that depends on what we do from here on out. Uh, it could be as little as about 2 degrees Celsius. It could go as much as even six degrees Celsius. That's about three and a half to about nearly 11 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and what will that do? What will the effect of that warming be? Well, that's what the current report is about. So here's the first thing to know. The takeaway from this report, if you've got nothing else from this, this is the takeaway. The report tells us, it confirms that climate change is already today affecting every continent and every ocean. The effects, the impacts of global warming are not coming in the future. They are here now. In the words of IP, uh, IPCC chairman, his name is Rajinda Pachuri, quoting him, no one on this planet is going to be untouched by the impacts of climate change. The ice caps are melting, the sea ice in the Arctic is collapsing, glaciers in West Antarctica may be nearing total collapse, heat waves and heavy rains are intensifying, coral reefs are dying, and fish and other species are migrating toward the poles if they're not going extinct. Some parts of the world may soon be at that tipping point where you can no longer reverse the change. Some parts of the world are already at it. The warm water coral reefs and the Arctic ecosystems are already at a point of irreversible change. It's already too late. The oceans are rising at a pace that threatens coastal communities as global average sea levels reach the new high last March. And much of that rise is caused by the expansion of ocean water because the oceans absorb most of the excess heat of the Earth. And as that water absorbs, it gets hotter, it expands, with the result that the oceans rise. What's even more worrisome is that for about the last 10 years, the rate at which the ocean level is rising is increasing. Water supplies are under stress. Rising temperatures are already depressing crop yields, including those of corn and wheat. Crop yields could decline by as much as 2% per decade for the rest of the century as the result of heat, drought, flooding, and changing rainfall patterns. That could lead to widespread hunger, economic disruption, including potentially even millions of environmental refugees and even resource wars. Which means, of course, to the point that it shouldn't be it's so obvious that it shouldn't be necessary to say it, it means that the poorest people of the world, who have had virtually nothing to do with causing global warming, will be the first and the hardest hit. In fact, the poor of Asia's coastal cities will be among the hardest hit. And you want to be angry as well as frustrated? All right. The body of the report cites a World Bank estimate that the poor countries of the world could need as much as $100 billion a year to adapt to the effects of climate change. 
At present, they're getting at most a few billion dollars a year. That $100 billion figure was removed from the executive summary for policymakers, the part that political leaders are actually read. It was cut because the rich countries of the world said the figure was unrealistic. For comparison, that $100 billion figure is about one-seventh of our current military spending per year. In the light of that, what do you think of the real odds that we'll actually do anything about global warming, about climate change, about the lives of our children and grandchildren? What are the chances of doing anything when we have bozos in, in the House of Representatives who have responded to all this by pushing a bill that essentially would require NOAA to stop researching climate change? I've said many times that uh, if you look back at the way you live, say in the 1980s, because combating global warming will require a change in our lifestyles. It's just a fact. Look back at how you live, say in the 1980s, the, the way you live, the, the level of technology around you, and ask yourself seriously, was that life so bad that you would be willing to sacrifice a world in order to avoid living that way again? And the truth is, I really wonder if we're up for it. So we're going to end up with this. Because that slides very neatly and comfortably into our other regular weekly feature. It's the Clown Award given for meritorious stupidity. And oh boy, do we have Test Stupid this week. The Big Red Nose this week goes to a previous winner, Center James Mountain Inhofe. And yes, Mountain really is his middle name, which is appropriate because he clearly has rocks in his head. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Senate Democrats staged an all-night Senate session talking about climate change. Well, in response to this, Senator rocks in his head, who has previously insisted that climate change is a hoax, because apparently there is some secret cabal involving thousands of scientists and scores of governmental and independent scientific groups from around the world, along with dozens of governments. Um, anyway, the senator said on the Senate floor, quoting him, Tonight, for all night long, you can say climate change is real, it's real, it's real, but people have heard that before. We have gone through some cold spells that are shocking and setting records. That's right, even leaving aside the fact that one of the baseline predictions of global warming is for more severe weather, both hot and cold, Inhofe is actually saying, as a serious argument, that climate change can't be real because it gets cold in winter. In some cases, it can be hard to figure out why a particular nanny nanny naysayer thinks the way they do, but in the case of Senator James Inhofe, it's easy. It's because he's a clown. All right, that's it for this week. I'm going to mention again that um, it's been suggested that I do a quarterly show on, and another thing, our science stuff. If you're interested in seeing such a show, let me know. I get a little response. Uh, I'll do it. If I don't get a little response, I won't. It's not complicated. So uh, if you're interested in seeing that, be sure to let me know, uh, either, either by email, at my site, whatever. Um, for the moment, though, you have the best week you possibly can. We will see you next week. Peace.